Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. I, I grew up catching tadpoles and climbing trees, and I've always had a, a very deep connection with nature that I've carried through my whole career. I live in the mountains. I have a wetland in the front of my house and a lake in the back. So all the, all the critters come through while I'm working and underneath my office window. Uh, it keeps me very connected. I was born and raised in Guatemala, where nature was my playground. My best friends were bees and ants. <laughs> I saw changes even from one year to the next. That was one of the reasons that I decided I was not only going to record and register what we were losing, but also find solutions that can actually tackle these drivers for change. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe, are challenged by this point of pale light. Humans can't survive without nature. We think we can. We think we're adaptable and, and entrepreneurial and innovative. But without nature, there is no humankind. We actually need nature for our economies to function. We need pollinators, we need water, we get our food from, from nature, we get our disaster risk reduction comes from nature, and all of that interlinks to think that they are separate doesn't make any sense. An example of when ecology and economy aren't working in tandem is when we do something like overfishing. In the short term, it makes perfect sense to take all the fish out of the sea and to eat up all the fish. But once you've done that, your wealth is gone and you cannot generate income or food from a basis of no wealth. The market doesn't tell us that there's no wealth. It only tells us about income. When you look at the uh, uh, economic growth of Thailand, our tourism sector is the most important sector where we can generate a lot of income. 20% of our world GDP growth rate comes from tourism sector. I, I want people to look at it uh, in terms of economic value and also in terms of uh, the value of biodiversity and the services that it gave to our country. We have gone through a process where we have successfully managed to destroy most of the biodiversity. To be able to conserve the little biodiversity that we have left and for us to be able to improve the current status of biodiversity, bearing in mind its connection to our economies and to our livelihoods, there is need for investment. Globally, uh, biodiversity investments are falling short. There's hardly any information available how much financing we actually need for nature. And so this is why actually Biofin was created. We recognized in 2010 that we did not know how much countries were investing in biodiversity, nor did we know how much they needed. And therefore we didn't know the gap between what they're investing and what they needed. Biofin is a methodology that was designed to answer those questions. The funding gap touches on all economic sectors. So we have to look into agriculture, we have to look into fisheries, we have to look into tourism, we have to look in all major sectors and always ask two questions. One, how much is spent on things that are beneficial for nature? And two, how much is spent on things that harm nature? So at this point, we estimate that we're under-investing in nature uh, to the tune of $800 billion per year, which sounds like a lot of money, but it's really only 0.1 to 0.3% of uh, global GDP per year. Governments have a role to play in creating an enabling environment for biodiversity investments to take place. They have a role to play in allocating and tracking public investment and how it is being used to ensure that there is adequate financing towards biodiversity initiators. 
private sector also has a role to play in responsibility around how they invest, making sure that their investments are nature positive and also having targeted investments in the biodiversity sector. Governments are approximately 20% of the global economy. If governments are the only entities that are investing in nature, we will surely lose this battle. So Biofin, its basic objective is to help countries close the funding gap. The way it does this is it works with governments and with other stakeholders at a country level, figure out what the funding gap is, figure out what's driving that, and then come up with a plan to reduce the funding gap. The Biodiversity Finance Plan is an implementation plan with prioritized biodiversity finance solutions and we can prioritize those investments such that we can close the identified gap. There's one more step and of course that is to implement the plan. We don't want to stop by just creating another beautiful United Nations supported plan so we're actively supporting countries to implement their biodiversity finance plans to really make sure that they can make a very significant reduction in their finance gap by the next decade. The island of Gotdao attracts up to 500,000 tourists each year. And this is very important for the local economy. But at the same time, it can also generate a lot of waste and marine debris and pressure on the corals. So a new finance solution was introduced where tourists pay a visitation fee of around 60 cents. And this can generate up to 360,000 US dollars per year for the people of Gotdao to protect the island's biodiversity. One of the uh, finance solutions was greenhouse gas emissions through the forest carbon projects to attract external investment in forest protection, uh, increased forest cover and sustainable forest management. So this private company financing the project for one and a half million dollars and investing uh, it to Kazakhstan forest protection and restoration. I've worked in this field for almost 20 years. I've, I've never been as excited. What we're seeing now is not just people within the conservation sector. We're seeing governments really understanding and even more interesting, we're seeing finance institutions really understanding the links between what they do in nature and businesses understanding the links and legitimately understanding it. In Costa Rica, we actually mobilized $1.8 million to reforest with 200,000 trees and achieve maintenance for five years. 19 private companies summed up efforts for this initiative. These businesses are already understanding what the cost of the loss of biodiversity is affecting planet, but also their businesses and through these financial solutions we have mobilized around 85 million dollars so i think we're achieving the the rate of scale that we need by joining biofin countries become part of a global community where they can learn from each other's experience countries can see and learn from each other but also especially i think inspire each other if you say hey look what costa rica did we can do that or look what Botswana did, look what Indonesia did, look what Kazakhstan did. They find solutions that they otherwise would not have found. And now we're seeing far more people who are trained in biodiversity finance, far more initiatives that are tackling different aspects of biodiversity finance. So there's a real wave of interest and an increase in expertise globally on biodiversity finance that we're very excited to see. There is a perceived trade-off between environmental and economic interests that's actually holding us back. Nature is really humanity's most powerful asset in dealing with these complex crises of nature loss, climate change, poverty, inequality and insecurity. Closing the biodiversity finance gap needs everyone to come together nature is our solution to our multi-dimensional crisis. This is an urgent call. People are already getting sick, dying, 
migrating because of biodiversity loss, because of climate risk. And so we are talking about lives now that depend on biodiversity, but we're also talking about our future as humanity that depends on biodiversity. The biodiversity finance gap is large, but it is not insurmountable. If we act now, we can ensure that our children's children will have the planet that we would like them to have. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It underscores our responsibility and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. <laughs>